accepting of the joint. Oh, good work. Welcome, everyone. This is the March 3rd uh, meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And seeing that we have a quorum, in fact, I think we have every member here, I'm just going to first check that everyone can hear and be heard since we are conducting this meeting virtually. Um, and I'll, when I say your name, just say whatever you want to indicate all systems are go. Farah? Here. Pam? Here. Irv? Here. Alex? Here. Jennifer? Here. Mandy? Present. And I believe that is our full committee. Um, and at this point, I'm turning it over to Sean because he knows the order. And I see that Guilford Mooring has joined us as well as Ray Harp uh, for several of the uh, projects that we're reviewing today. Guilford, and, are, you, are you okay if I Paul let... Paul Bachman is clearly here as well. <laughs> yeah. Guilford, are you okay if I let Ray go first? Um, he has fewer projects than you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Ray, are you okay uh, leading off? I am. Do you want me to bring John Coelho into the room as well? Yes, please. Okay. That will actually allow him to mute his, his Zoom. Maybe. Uh, there he is. You're in. Recording in progress. So Ray, the um the three projects. So I do have John Quello here with okay. me. Uh, our projects do affect Cherry Hill in particular, and so he's here as a sort of a support for those requests. So do you want to? Um, I know you had three projects that you submitted, Ray, and I know there was a fourth that you might want to, um, discuss today, just as part of the whole capital planning process. So, um, you guys can kick it off with um whatever ones you want to start with okay i appreciate it sorry we're trying to work on getting a mute here are you if are you guys right next to each other i can yeah one of you mutes while the other one talks then you you'll avoid that um effect okay how are we um, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute John while you start, Ray. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So it's not not letting me mute John though. I'll I will turn John off, and I'll just pull him on when I need him to. And you're okay right now, right? There's no feedback coming in, so whatever you did, maybe John, you're me. you're muted. Okay. So we have three uh, projects and we are, I think it's a request that we have to pivot a little bit. I spoke to Sean already about it. Um, two of our requests are Cherry Hill related and that's one of the reasons why I had John come over there. They are long-term, uh, they're long-term plans to try and remove some of the, the pressure off of our operating budget at Cherry Hill. Their plans to, for, for, uh, maintenance of the facilities and to and to make good on the fact that we don't have a large staff up there. There, there are things that we think are important. There's a public safety bit in one of them, um, and so I'd like to start with the Cherry Hill pieces, uh, uh, the parking lot, uh, which the, in talking with DPW, I spoke with Amy Rizeki today about the about the cost on that repaving, the. The parking lot was up until Winterfest. Uh, at the beginning of Winterfest, it was there was a there was a large amount of damage to the mouth of the parking lot right on the entrance coming in in potholes, large potholes that were a matter of concern for the public that use it. We we're in the off season, so the so the uh, uh, you know the uh, it's not a lot of golfers that use the space, but we did have. Um, a number of potential skiers that were using. We had a number number of people in the public and community that were using it for the trail spaces. Um, the uh, 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 of the of the parking lot were issues for us. 
primarily this year and this winter because the the uh, uh, John Quello and our maintenance group that that manages the course in the off season and conservation that uses it when we have to plow when we have to move things in there that lot is still a major concern and the lot we've we've basically been in process of trying to trying to do patchwork repairs on it consistently over the course of the last certainly before I came in. Um, the original the original parking lot was was uh, was instituted in 1993, and the life of that should have taken us up to, uh, I believe, 2001, 2003 or so. So the life of the parking lot, which was intended to be, uh, I think it was an 18 year life on it, uh, uh, which would be 2010. I think it was an 18 year life on the parking lot before it needed. Uh, uh, repaving. We're well beyond that right now. And the damage that we thought was was potentially going to be incurred on vehicles that were using it, both ours and the public, uh, we thought there was a large amount of liability that the town needed to be aware of. Um, and when I say part, when I say that there were uh, uh, potholes in the, in the driveway, if you'd been there, I think you would see that they're, you know, they're they're basically craters in the in the front of the. We did, we couldn't use the parking lot for Winterfest partially because uh, we were afraid of bringing public vehicles, bringing vehicles from the public into the space. So we couldn't use the space. If we can avoid using the space for public vehicles, we did. DPW did invest, and and thank you, Guilford, who's here right now. But thank you to the DPW who right after that Winterfest kickoff, they did the. The uh, temporary patchwork. It was about five thousand dollars that was put into uh, putting a temporary fill into those spaces. And right now, the feedback has been that it's been pretty good. We're hoping that we've basically moved past most of the the deep freeze for the winter time, um, but the springtime we know frequently will open up those holes again. And there is a chance that we'll have to uh, use patchwork funds to, to keep that space operable in the future and certainly going into next winter. I don't, it's not as immediate. I wanted to make sure that I'm mentioning that, but the, the cost that the cost estimate of doing a full repavement is, is uh, in the area of a hundred thousand um, dollars. And that's before you look at ADA compliance, which is going to be a major, major piece, of making the, the the parking spaces that are are handicap accessible to make to make it truly ADA compliant. In progress. To make it truly ADA compliant is going to make uh, is going to take a little bit more effort there. It's not as immediate as the fourth piece that I want to introduce here today, but the parking lot. I can field any questions about that. Okay. Uh, when we get a chance to the, the irrigation piece, I think that we are going to end up pulling off of the I've got the echo again. I apologize. I, I believe that we're going to take the irrigation request off of the immediate table also because we're going to try and speak with finance. I can't do it. So just turn it off. Try and try and make that a a request that we can work with finance to try and talk about putting a line in for irrigation because part of our part of our problem in that capital request is uh, is the amount of uh, uh, amount over budget we spent last year in our maintenance budgets and our grounds maintenance and our equipment maintenance. We had uh, we were we were overspent, under budgeted, overspent, and and uh, um, and uh, the irrigation piece was a major hit there. Uh, that is also less of concern than the equipment piece that I want to bring John Quello in on. Um, you've been speaking for the last week about trying to trying to change our priorities here, and I don't know if this is a strange request. I don't know if this is a request that that I can appeal to ask for here, but uh, our most pressing capital concern right now, which puts those two in, in uh, on the back burner for us in the queue for another time, I'd be happy to talk about what those needs are uh, in the future of our capital requests. But the top dresser that was part of our request last year, um, 
our our equipment top dresser for the for the Cherry Hill course for Cherry Hill maintenance. Uh, our our uh, you know it, uh, there's a there's a immediate concern that we are using uh, equipment that is that is on its last legs and is ill-equipped to do the work that we're asking it to do. And if we don't get that, uh, if we don't get that grant, then our fear is that we're gonna be spending a lot of money in the next few months to replace it. Um, it's It takes a burden away from our maintenance. It takes a burden away from our, uh, our staff, our volunteer staff that has to come in and aerate the greens. The top dresser is a major piece of of keeping that course up and operational. So I do wanna bring John Quello in for this. So the, the, uh, the top dresser item, uh, that is uh, being submitted for this year was uh, originally, well, a, la it was part of last year's ask. Um, and it was originally, uh, I think, a 2018 capital uh, request uh, packaged in with other pieces of equipment, which we did receive last year, uh, a used mower and a used utility vehicle. Uh, the top dresser unit is what we use um, as we're finishing off top uh aerating the greens, which is done twice a year. Um, it essentially fits in the back of a the small utility vehicle that we got last year and is loaded with a, buck, a tractor filled with sand uh, and it drives across the greens and fills in the holes that we created earlier in the process uh, with sand. And uh, when they fill, when those holes fill in, the greens are playable again, usually takes a day or two. Um, and that's part of maintaining the health of uh, cutting grass at an eighth of an inch. So it's a it's a twice a year thing. Um, the 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 top dresser that we've been using, believe it or not, came with Cherry Hill uh, when the town bought it from the Maxim family in 1986, and is about the size of um, a poker table. Uh, so it can't be loaded directly from a bucket of a tractor. The sand has to be shoveled in by hand, which requires a extensive group of volunteers uh, and just about all afternoon. Um, and we use that for a long time, but we don't have access to the volunteers that we used to get for a number of different reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, this thing could break, it's run on a chain and it could literally break anytime it's 20 plus years past its lifespan. Um, and this new piece of equipment would fit right in the utility vehicle that we got last year. It's run off the hydraulics uh, and it has the added benefit of being able to assist other departments in town. Um, there's, there was talk in past years of uh, the Parks Department perhaps needing a top dresser from time to time for an athletic field or the soccer fields at Plum Brook. And this is certainly uh, a small enough piece of equipment that it can be put on a trailer and transported to other parts of town to assist them if uh, they needed something like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know that they have an interest in it, but it would certainly be possible that that could be, uh, you know, beneficial for them as well. Ray, could you speak to the cost for the? I don't know, you may have mentioned so it, but I would like to ask if there are any questions about any of the Cherry Hill requests. Well, that was my first question, Sean. I'm just yeah, Ray. Ray could you tell us the cost of the top dresser? Because we, we, we have a just... we have a green lot, lot and we have irrigation, but we don't. I didn't see top dresser. Correct. And so my request is just if we if I, I I don't know what the process would be here, if there is an opportunity to do it, uh, I would like for our capital request to take a back seat if if possible for the immediate uh, concern of of the uh, top dresser. Um, it's uh, the request that we put in would would be more costly than the top dresser and less immediately important for us. I could, I, and, and not having done is not, not having been a part of this process, it may be that the ship has sailed, it may be that it's too complicated, it may be that, that, that there is not a, a way for us to do that right now. We have to just 
time that are put in the queue or we can talk to finance about what we do if and when we we uh, lose the service of the of this piece but I would like to be able to request that the JCPC be able to prioritize the top dresser uh, and, uh, and and let that take priority over our other requests Pam thanks um, maybe um, if someone could just clarify then um, the price of the top dresser and then which are the what what are the actual four projects because we have we have sheets for the parking lot repairs at twenty thousand dollars but I just actually heard that a full repavement would be a close to a hundred or a hundred thousand plus. And then the there. so I'm just trying to figure out what the actual projects in whatever priority order, but at least all of them. And my apologies, the, the original number that we put in was based on the, on a estimate that we had gotten that was in my notes from, from prior years, there was a $20,000 uh, pavement reached out to DPW and they were doing research after the, uh, you know, I, they, were, they were doing research for me to figure out if that cost was appropriate. If that, if the $20,000 was cost was appropriate. I didn't think that it was based on what John was telling me the cost of, of black topping the, the, the parking lot was. I didn't have in any of my notes, just what that, what that, uh, 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 what the, the the full repavement of the parking lot would end up doing. The twenty thousand dollars would not. My guess is that twenty thousand dollars that was requested before, uh, or put in the queue before, was probably put in to uh, to uh, put in a temporary fix. Was probably put in to do a partial fix of of the parking lot. But uh, the concern that we have is that by doing that, we're going to keep on doing that in a couple of years, and that that cost will keep on going. Uh, it was it was encouraged that I look at doing a full regrade of the parking lot, and we try to get that that cost estimate in. It was it was substantially more than twenty thousand dollars. Can I right. interrupt? So can I can we clarify which projects we should consider? Do you want to put in the full pavement project, the top dresser, and what were, what were the other two projects that you uh, the irrigation you said you would. Irrig the irrigation system. Okay. Uh, and those uh, are the other two items. Correct. And okay. that's two items. The third item is the van. It's a is the uh, department van. So those are the three items that we were we, that we were introducing here to the JCPC. I believe that we have already taken out of the uh, out of the request the signage. Uh, I've asked to have the signage removed from it. So if there is a fourth one, if, you, if you're referring to a fourth request, I asked to have the signage removed because that was granted last year. I think she made the fourth request. I think she's include, um, Pam's include in the, um, the one you just made, top yeah, the top dresser. Yeah. So the fourth, the fourth request would be the top, top dresser. And that is, that is uh, emphatically our first concern. We can get by on the other. We can get by on the other pieces if necessary. But our first concern is a top dresser. Uh, how much? A uh, quote that I just received yesterday is uh, just under fifteen thousand for the top dresser. So that's a current number. You said fifteen, John. Yeah. Okay. And I can put all of this into paperwork for anybody who is looking for. I can I can submit this to you all as soon as tomorrow morning for anybody that's looking for those updated numbers. Um, uh, again, John has re reached out and said that this is a capital concern that we put in last year. Uh, and and um, uh, I should have probably put it in this year also because it wasn't granted last year. I didn't see in the queue. This was, that was a capital concern that we had from last year. Um, and uh, the concern is that the top person that we're using is going to uh, 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 what what we're expire. using right now is going to expire. Okay, I see two people, um, Irv and then Farah. So uh, it would be helpful to just to know what your total capital request would be, as A and B. Uh, 
the top dress is a, a item for fifteen thousand uh, dollars. When we would when you're considering your entire uh, capital request, would you consider putting in there the leasing of that uh, top dresser as opposed to uh, purchasing our right? Those type of items are not available for lease. They're um, they're long term purchases that golf courses make. The uh, just so you're aware, the used equipment that we got last year, the mower and the utility vehicle that would transport the top dresser were both um, made available as used equipment because they came off of lease uh, from uh, other golf courses in another part of the country, uh, somewhere on the Eastern seaboard. Uh, and they were refurbished and uh, sold to us as used equipment. But things like top dressers, aerators, uh, some of the other very highly specialized pieces of equipment that are used on golf courses uh, generally aren't available for lease or even rent. Uh, you just have to, you have to buy them and you own them forever. I mean, you know, this thing will last uh, for many, many years. Um, and, uh, you know, probably would never be replaced in this type of form again, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not something that you can find on a lease. So for all, and I think, or if I, we did hear it, I think Ray, there is a request to get back to us for each of the pieces and are some of them dropping off the list, but for all, go on. Um, Ray, just, just for my notes, just to uh, be perfectly clear, is your order of priority drop dresser, irrigation driveway, and then oh. you took the, off the van? The priority, my second priority would be the drive, would be the parking lot. The um, parking lot, okay. All right, thank is, you. Uh, uh, that's with the caveat that that I understand that the cost that we're asking for is considerably more than what we put into the request for. Uh, if if I had a, a, a order of need of of urgency, the parking lot would be the second thing on that list. Uh, sizable amount to be asking for right now. Um, for a full for a full scale uh, parking lot uh, repaving, that cost would be a hundred thousand dollars, and that's substantially more than the cost there. Third thing would probably be the van. Uh, the third thing would be the the recreation van, which is also uh, it, it's it's also a matter of if it breaks down and it's not that far away, but if it breaks down, we are. Uh, we'll be scrambling to try and to try and do some of our basic uh, department needs. So it's trying to get ahead of the the equipment and vehicles that are that are uh, uh, that that are that are on their last legs. We're trying to get ahead of the issues and not have to spend the money because we didn't have it in the queue from the beginning. Okay, thank you. So thank you. Uh, Alex's hand is up, and Sean. Um, I don't. Would, I no, just. Would... I just wanted to say. Um, I'll work with Ray to send out. We'll get forms submitted for the, for the top, top dresser, dresser, and we'll update the parking one so that it includes the full amount. And I'll send out an updated pr preliminary capital improvement plan that has those numbers in it, so you can see what the new sort of summary looks like. I think there was one other adjustment we had to make as well, so we'll put those adjustments into the into the spreadsheet that you've seen so you can see what the new gap is uh, for your deliberation in a few, a few weeks. Alex? Yeah, that, my, I guess, question slash comment dovetails with what Sean just said. So, you know, we've got a top dresser for 15,000, repaving the parking for 100,000, the department van, which I assume is the Amherst rec van listed at 40,000, and then yes. we've got irrigation for 75,000. Yes. While I appreciate you putting things off, you know, we'll be here next year having the same conversation, right? And there are always cuts that have to be made. So I guess um, I appreciate the prioritization, um, but it would also be helpful to know how far out things could be. Like, are we looking at this additional, mm -hmm. you know, over $200,000 next year, or could it be over two or three years, or just give us a good sense of sort of what push there is and where it can go because I think that you know if there's funding this year for something you know yes. I don't know I just want to have the big picture thanks 
Thank you. Um, the the top dresser is we can't wait. Uh, we might not be able to wait beyond you know the next couple months. So the urgency there and the utility of it. I mean, I think that's that's a urgent, immediate concern. The the parking lot is like I don't want to. I'm reluctant to open the parking lot if we didn't get that temporary fix. And again, thank you DPW for that. But I'm I'm reluctant to open the parking lot if we don't get some address uh, some somehow address the fact that 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 the public's vehicles that our plows and our and our town our town vehicles are are, are in the line there. I think there's there's potentially a large amount of damage that comes from there, and I don't want the town to be held liable. Uh, how long this happens in my conversation with Amy today, you know, we we believe that we probably are going to need to have this. Uh, uh, how long this lasts depends on how much it keeps and depends on the weather a little bit, but we will be in a situation asking about that again next year. And if we don't have a fix on those holes, the holes didn't get repaired, they just got filled. And so if the whole if we if we are in bigger holes, if those if those potholes in the lot are are opening up larger this year through this spring before we open the golf course, or certainly as we move into the winter, as we close the golf course next year, we're going to be in a position where we're going to need to have a dramatic fix there also. I don't think that parking lot can wait without investing a lot of money in you know, these twenty thousand dollars fixes without putting five thousand dollars here, five thousand dollars here, or you know, however we've been managing those those pieces on a lot that's thirty years old. Um, I don't think that that parking lot should be opened if we are dodging potholes like we were this past year, and so and so in that in that situation for time frame. Uh, that could be as early as this spring. If we have a frozen spring, that could be that we're sitting in here in in the winter time when we start back up and and talking about how you know there's uh, you know uh, forbid uh, that we have some damage to something beforehand that that a, a car that comes in hits a hits a hole and there's damage that they that they ask for a uh, conversation from the town on um, that. That is, I think that's the urgency there. How long does, uh, how long does that, the life of how we have this timetable set up, how long does that last? It could be a year there. The irrigation piece is one that I think John and I have talked about for a while about putting it in um, as a way of managing. The, it's it's more concerned because it manages the amount of spending we have to do. We, we know we ask for a lot of the budget is uh, we were overspent there because because we have to spend so much money on on irrigation on these pieces that would be fixed if we spend that money right now if we spend that money and and try and take care of these pieces the, the labor that we put into it the service that that, that we bring in to do this uh, the amount of time and energy that we put into it that could be spent someplace else. Uh, uh, how long does our irrigation last the way it is, John? I mean, how how uh, uh, how what is the life of? Uh, it's not a case where we're repairing something; we're basically replacing something. How long does does the Cherry Hill irrigation system last right now? It was installed in two thousand uh, between two thousand two thousand one, uh, with a twenty five year lifespan, and we're at year twenty three. Um, so we're we're starting to we're starting to see the effects of components wearing out. Uh, my my major concern is that the uh, pump motor itself or the pump, uh, which uh, just you know takes the water out of the pond and puts it into the system, if that fails, then all of the the rest of it is uh, it's not functioning and we don't have water. We don't have a golf course. Um, so you know we've been I'm meeting with different representatives from different. Uh, companies that handle these components to try and get a uh, plan together where, uh, you know, a phased in replacement upgrades uh, could happen where we replace certain components one year, uh, the pump another year, other components a third year. Uh, most golf courses would not try to replace an entire irrigation system 
in one season. Um, obviously, a new installation is a different uh, situation, but we have a system uh, and it does work most of the time. Uh, but it's something that we have to be, you know, we have to have the discussion because the, the days of it starting to work less and uh, not work more are coming up. And so um, I'm just trying to avoid a, a big sticker shock situation when we get to a point where uh, we start having more failures and successes with it. Um, also uh, worth noting is that uh, the the pump, the engine there is also our our hope uh, was that that would be able to align with the college with the town's uh, 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 sustainability initiatives. Uh, it's currently fossil fuel burning, right? And we would correct. look to replace it with uh, something electric or some exactly. other option. So I, I'm just going to. Mandy, I'm just going to add on to something was discussed that I'm calling you um, on the parking lot, Sean. Um, could we get an estimate of whether we could continue to do patches, $5,000 patches? And the reason I'm asking, Ray, I mean, I know what the parking lot looks like. Um, the When you come north and turn right to go up Montague Road on your way to the park to Cherry Hill, you'll notice that there are regularly orange cones there and then they're removed because DPW fills the hole. Then a year later, the orange cone is back and then we fill the hole. So what I'm thinking is that some of these repairs, they do last um, rather than doing the whole parking lot. So I would just like a, an estimate that what is, what is there less than a hundred? And then my other question, and I don't need it answered now is, I think we have a machine, but I got different that can actually cut a deep hole and plug plug a pothole, but it's hard to do it in the winter time. So I'm just looking for something nearer to the 20,000 and how much could we get for that um, that isn't a pure waste of money rather than doing the whole parking lot. Because I also think if we can keep it level, it's a pretty level parking lot and golfers don't mind pulling their carts across uh, gravelly they don't need a full pavement um they don't want potholes so i just would like to have a closer look at that number before you just change it from twenty thousand to 100 you know when you come back to us on a what could we do yeah mandy yeah thank you um it sounds like you believe some of these um capital requests are very urgent. Um, and so I guess my question isn't necessarily for you versus Sean. You know, you're talking about a top dresser that sounds like it gets used twice a year, probably one towards the spring and one towards the fall um, that might not last this spring, but we're funding starting July 1. Um, and so a, a situation where the funds don't come through for, say, a uh, the parking lot or the top dresser till July 1, are we looking at a situation where we might not be able to open the golf course until the parking lot is done? Or what would happen if the top dresser isn't there? And if some of that is the case where we're looking at not being able to open the course until this is done, is there money in this year's capital budget or excess that some of this could be done through this year's budget? And that's this question for Sean, but are you really seriously considering not being able to potentially open the golf course, I guess would be my question for the two of you. The, uh, I, I don't think either item would keep us from opening when we're gonna be able to open, which uh, uh, up until a couple of days ago, I would've thought might've been at the end of March, but um, still might. Uh, the, the top dresser, uh, is well past its lifespan. And uh, with any luck, we'll get through one more aeration at the end of April with it. Um, it, it wor worst case scenario is that I didn't aerate the greens uh, if it failed uh, when we test it before we use it. And, and that's and that's not an ideal situation by any means because that leads to uh, you know loss of turf health and diseases. And um, we start losing grass. You start losing grass on the greens, you start losing customers. So um, you know, that's a, the situation that, uh, you know, could be avoided if we can just, you know, get a new one in here at some point. Um, but the, the parking lot, I think, um, has been hanging on for dear life for a few years now. 
uh, and and I guess thanks to DPW coming up and, and helping us out a couple different times uh, with various uh, levels of patching. Um, you know, it's it's functional, it's usable, but it's it's I, where I think we're at the point where um, you know, do we want to keep asking for patching and repairs? Uh, and again, I don't know what the cost of those are. That's that's something that Guilford or, or Amy could address. Um, you know, are we are we throwing good money after bad? I guess is what I'm thinking on the parking lot. Um, I you know, a hundred thousand dollars for a parking lot is a lot of money. I I get that. Um, and there might be some alternatives to complete blacktop um, that would uh, you know solve the problem uh, and and come in under that that big number. But um, you know, I just I don't I don't know what those options are. Uh, that's more of a, a DPW question, I think. Um, but I, I don't believe either one of those situations would keep us from opening when we're supposed to. Can I ask just one more fact finding? Um, does Amherst College have anything we could borrow? Or does UMass have the ability to help us out on this in terms of equipment? So those I don't need answers to that now. They they do an entire turf management program at UMass where they're teaching people. So they, including teaching people who are going to go out and manage golf courses. So I don't know how often we look over there to see whether there's some in-kind help we might get. Um, that That's... Again, I don't want that answered right now, but it's looking at a way of uh, taking some pressure off us. Thanks. Thank you. And to Mandy, your other question, um, we do have the sort of leftover capital fund where if we needed to appropriate something before July 1, um, we could. It's still to go through the appropriation process, but it would be available before July 1. So I. Not seeing any other hands, so I want to thank you very much um, for all you do out there. It was an active season last year, as far as I could see. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, John. Not a problem. Thank you, everybody. So Guilford, our DPW superintendent, is here as well, and he is up next to talk about uh, DPW Capital. Morning. Well, good afternoon. Uh, we have a lot of stuff. Do you want me to go through each and every item or do you want to just ask questions? I would do a quick overview of um, each of them and then we'll do questions at the end. Okay. So... There's certain things that we do every year. One of them is our, right now is our transportation plan. We take about $50,000 and we put it aside to help with a transportation project that we're working on. Um, this, most of this money goes towards um, surveying work or doing traffic studies or gathering the information we need to actually make a, make a response to something. So that's what this is for. Um, Stormwater management program is sort of the same thing, except that it's required by federal law that we um, do certain permit things every year. Um, right now we're doing a lot of sampling and building a database of what the pollutants are in our stormwater discharges. So all the pipes you see around town, um, they discharge usually into a stream or to a ditch. And then we've been going around and sampling and categorizing what those um, pollutants are. And then we'll come back at some other point and do some bigger projects to remove those pollutants. So that's what that plans is. Um, next is um, there's $200,000 for sidewalk repair around the town. Um, last year, we did a section of Amity Street. We did some work around the school, the high school, and um, just some general repairs downtown. Um, we do try, tend to concentrate on the downtown and connecting the downtown to possibly schools and working around schools. Uh, we choose the easiest projects first. Um, if, the project, if a sidewalk doesn't meet ADA requirements, we are going to skip that sidewalk unless there's a really, really pressing issue that we need to address. Um, because if the sidewalk doesn't meet ADA requirements. We have to go through a process with the Architectural Review Board in Massachusetts to get permission to make it 
and put it in a place so it's, um, it's because it's not meeting the requirements. So those just take a little more work and we, we tend to put those off to the side. Um, we'll probably continue our work um, right now. We, for the upcoming year, we already have contracts in place. We're gonna be doing Kendrick, uh, sorry, Kellogg Avenue and we're gonna be North doing North Pleasant Street and putting new sidewalk, replacing sidewalks and putting new sidewalks in over there. And we have a list of other ones that are coming right behind that, but they're not on the top of my head right now. Uh, the next is a half a million dollars for road resurfacing. We take that and we add it to the road resurfacing we get from chapter 90 and we resurface roads. Um, we have a contract going out soon, a bid going out soon to do West Pomeroy Lane and the Eastern part of Pomeroy Lane. So that would be the Pomeroy Lane from Middle Street back to about Carriage Lane. Those are, those are the two we have. And then we have another project that we're putting together. We'll have two bids this year. Um, the second bid will have a, a bunch more smaller stuff in it, um, more residential streets as well as one or two major streets. Gilford, can I interject for a quick second? Um, so in the plan, you'll notice that we put a million dollars into roads. Originally, when we were developing the plan, we were targeting 500,000. Um, but moving some things back and looking at some different pieces of the plan, we were able to bump it up to a million. So the, the project request in your packet is for 500,000, but the actual proposal is going to be for a million dollars. And as you all, well, most of you all know, we could put six million dollars into roads and it would not be enough so, um, so it's, it's just putting more into roads and then the other thing Guilford, i'll just say you can still cover it when you get there but just so you're aware um in case i forgot to mention it to you is the north amherst intersection we've put that into the planning bucket not on the plan yet but into the the uh the list of projects that we're we're looking for funding for if you're going to cover the north amherst intersection yeah that's the next one on my list okay good so we did ask for $450,000 to start the final design and plan for this intersection at North, North Amherst. Um, the one issue that we're gonna have a problem, well, the one, it's not a problem. The one issue we're gonna have is, is that this is a project which covers state-owned property, state-owned roadway and town-owned roadway. So there's some requirements we have to meet that we don't normally meet when we do a town, uh, a completely town-owned piece of roadway. Um, the state likes certain things proven to them um, a certain way and we have to do it that way. So it just costs a little more and that's why you might think this number is a bit high, but this is for the final design and final layout of that project. Um, and then again, the, the next one on my list is the chapter 90 funds, which is about 841,000. Those can only be used for road repairs. Um, they cannot be used for road maintenance. So if you wanna talk about potholes, I can't use any of the chapter 90 money for potholes. You can only use chapter 90 money for road repair, which is a crack seal, an overlay, a reconstruction, an intersection improvement, those type of larger, larger types of project. You can buy equipment with this, but we haven't bought equipment with chapter 90 money in a long time. Um, on, my on, list, the, on the cherry, um, I don't know, did you hear the question about Cherry Hill earlier about would 20,000 be sufficient to do a good patch and repair job filling in potholes there? Not, but not doing a full resurfacing? And what issues um, might there be with that, that approach? I know we did an estimate for Cherry Hill and I do not know what the estimate was. Um, Ray, I think said it was around 100,000 was what he came back with. So all our, all our estimates are based on mass highway numbers. So when you get an estimate like that, that's that's the most that's a very conservative. We tend to be conservative. We don't like to come back and ask for more money when we do a a, a paving project. So it's a very conservative number. Um, can you do a little more with less? Probably. Can you do a good job with twenty thousand? Maybe not. Okay. The other two projects on the list for um, the non-vehicle projects is the uh, the field maintenance equipment or sort of different, uh, I think got a few different requests within the, the full uh, project request for field maintenance equipment. And then tree removal, so uh, tree removal for 20,000. And one other thing I'll just mention that we added is we've modified that to be tree removal and also tree planting. Um, so it could be either or um, and give that capital request a little bit more flexibility. 
do you want to talk uh do you want to speak a little bit more about the field equipment and where that equipment would be primarily used and um sort of the rationale for that one yes so the field equipment you'll see there's two requests there's a two hundred and thirty thousand dollar request and there's a um it should be a seventy six thousand dollar request but is that what you have? What do you have for the second one? Um, I've got a 230,000, a 30,000, and a 55,000 are the three pieces I have. I can tell you what those are. Yes, that's how I broke it down. I actually got broken down three ways. Okay. Sorry. So when the discussion was being had about community field and the high school track and a turf field versus a grass field, um, and it was pointed out we did not have the equipment to maintain grass fields to the level people wanted, um, we came up with a list of what we needed to do that. So it's broken down in what's immediately needed, the next phase and the third phase of what's needed. So the $230,000 is what's immediately needed if we want to maintain all the fields around the high school, middle school and community field at a level that will um, that a level that was described during those meetings about the high school turf field. Um, it does include some of the equipment that the um, golf course was asking for, but it's much bigger equipment than what the golf course asked for actually, because our prices are almost twice as much for their equipment because it's and obviously I, I don't know what they're asking for. So I shouldn't probably talk about There's, it. They're just asking for a top dresser for the green. Um, where yeah, is, so we're, we're looking a, for a top dresser for the whole field, which is a much larger piece of equipment. Could it be so, used for a green? Could it be used for a green, or is it too big? It's too big. It would. Okay. It would kind of. It would be very. It would be very interesting to watch it do a green. That would be kind of a good YouTube video. It would destroy the green while it was doing it, probably right. Uh, it would just be funny. We could probably make. We could probably make some side money off of TikTok or however the YouTube, the YouTube guys make money. Yeah, we could probably make some. So Sorry, Gilford, one question that came in was, is that equipment going to be used anywhere other than the regional fields and community field, or would that is that where the majority of its time would be spent? The majority of its time will be spent on those fields because those are the fields that they want to be a certain level of playing. We would use them on all the other fields we have in town because we once we have the equipment, we would definitely use it to improve the conditions on those other fields. Um, what we're asking for in the first group of equipment is a deep, deep tine aerator, a top dresser, another mower. Um, this mower is meant for the type of condition they want that grass to be in. Um, through a field groomer and uh, a broadcast spreader for grass seed and fertilizer. And there's also, um, there have to be a piece of equipment to um, to move this equipment with or be a prime mover, such as either a tractor or a tool cat. Um, we're leaning towards a tool cat, which is a brand name, not a, not just a plain, not just a regular tractor. Um, so that's the priority one group of equipment we're asking for. And it is, it is a little bigger than what you would see on a golf course because it is meant to cover a larger area a little more quickly and speedily. Um, do you... Gilford, I think you're aware of this, um, but just to, so everyone knows there's other investments going into the fields up there. I think the regional school has also requested a well, um, uh, I forgot exactly what it's called, but something to help with the watering of the fields was part of their regional capital request this year. I've heard about that. We're not, um, we, if we heard about that, it's actually a good I hope if you can get a well that will actually give you the water you need, that would be really a great addition. Um, but if you can't find a well with that, if you can't get the water at that spot to give you the output you need, it's, I don't know how it would work. We haven't really looked at it and haven't been asked about it either. Yeah. Um, do you want me to keep going or you want to ask some questions? Why don't we, why don't we stop here? Cause we're done with the, um, um, non-vehicle requests. Why don't we stop for questions now and then you can do vehicles after. Do you want me to call on people, Kathy? Uh, Farah, do you want to go? 
Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Do those fields include Plumbrook or is it just the fields around the, the high school and the middle school? The, pri the primary place of use would be the, the high school fields around the high school, middle school and community field, but we would eventually use it at Plumbrook, um, Kiwanis Field, Plumbrook, Kiwanis Field. Um, Fort, when the Fort River fields are put back together, we'd use it at Fort River. And um, that's it. Okay, thank you. Jennifer. Okay, I'm trying to keep up with what Guilford's saying and what the attachments are in our packet. So I see field maintenance equipment phase one and phase two, but you said there was a third one. What's that one called? It's actually probably called leaf collection equipment. Leaf collection equipment. Is it? Can someone point me to what the file name is called in the packet? Hold on, yeah, I'll tell you. Oh, the I submitted it under leaf collection equipment. Leaf collection system. Uh, let me just take a quick. So we have, uh, I think it's turf vacuum. Does that sound okay? Possible uh, Guilford turf vacuum. It yeah. So be. there's field maintenance equipment phase one, field turf. maintenance equipment phase two, and then turf vacuum. Okay. And did we just talk about one of them, or did we talk about all three? I'm sorry. Did we were no. we just talking about phase one? We just talked about phase one. Okay. Great. Thank you. So okay. So. Um, Guilford, you said that you took in the input that was given at the various public meetings about the um, the state of the fields in the context of talking about the high school track and field project. But like, do, I, I mean, is, is there like a master plan for the maintenance of these fields? Or I, I mean, I'm I, I'm hoping that you didn't just like hear people say things and then like come up with a plan as opposed to like. I don't know, having some intention with coming up with like a master plan to 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 maintain all the fields as opposed to just just hearing what the people happen to say who happen to give public comment. I just want to I'm just asking if like there is some intentional planning done as in terms of what those fields actually need, as opposed to like what we may have heard in public comment. What we did is we took the comments and what <clears throat> what people expressed they wanted the level to be of the conditions of the surface. And we came up with a plan of what you would need and how often you would need to do it. There's actually two more pieces of this turf management plan that is not in the capital plan because they're not capital items. Um, there's about a $63,000 increase in the operating budget to pay for materials such as fertilizer, seed, sand, water, chemicals, and um, some other things that would be needed to also maintain these fields. And there's a, a staff requ staffing request because it's going to take another person to probably maintain it at the level they're asking for as well. So there's there is a bigger plan. There is more thought put into this, and it's just not a bunch of capital requests. It's a capital, and it's going to be a continuing um, maintenance uh, operating request and a continual per personnel request to make this work if it's going to work. There's three pieces. Okay, I, I'm, I'm maybe I'm thinking of it wrong, or I don't want to harp on the same on the on the. I don't want to harp on this one thing, but um, ha, like, ha, was there input? Did you get input from um, the superintendent or the fields, the athletic director about the about what what the schools would like to see in terms of the state of the fields? I mean, the you know the people who gave public comment, they have they have valid you know needs and concerns, of course. But like, I don't know. I just I would I wouldn't want to see decisions based on what was heard at the public comment from the people who happened to speak, <laughs> as opposed to like talking with the schools and the the as I said, the superintendent and the athletic director about what they see the needs are and what state they'd like to see the fields in. So Adam, who is our fields foreman, and Alan Snow, who's the director of that division, he talks, they talk a great deal with Victoria, who's the athletic director at the high school, and they pretty much put this all together. Um, Victoria confirmed what they, confirmed the level they wanted to have, and the three of them kind of talked it out, and this is what came out of those discussions. Great. And just building off of that, there was the the plan for all the fields where every field was looked at and every single field, regardless of whether it was an artificial surface or a natural grass surface, every field needed improvements um, and needed additional maintenance um, and equipment to support that maintenance. Sure. 
Sean, are you going to do the call? Oh yeah, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. Okay, so um, I I'm going to stay on fields right now, but then I want to come back to um, roads. Uh, so I just on the fields, um, I think it would be useful to get a little bit of a narrative with this set of pieces that addresses what Jennifer just said, you know, that there's an operating cost side, so there's, there's a plan. Um, Cause I thought this excellent, I mean, we might be able to capture it in excellent minutes and notes and we can put it in our report, but just a little bit more on um, what's being thought and the vacuum and leaf remover. Cause my initial thing was how much of this was for the artificial turf as opposed to grass anywhere, you know, are we, are we adding costs because we're expecting to have an artificial turf? If not, will we need something else if we have artificial turf? So I would just like something that's a little bit more, as you said, you know, thinking about just over the next few years, um, what we're gonna need. And then my second question is when I asked of Ray about the golf course, UMass Amherst, but UMass Lowell does turf management, does a whole lot of this. Um, do we ever use their resources in terms of, um, when I called them one of them up, they said they came over to Mill River and uh, the Mill River Recreation Area and gave some advice. And those actually, those fields work quite well for, I mean, they're baseball fields, but so I don't know whether we ever use that, but I think a memo that ties this together, Sean, would just be useful to have both in the packet and in the background when we do a report, um, because otherwise it seems like a lot of pieces without a, a whole. And I'll, I'll come back on my road questions. If You could ask, um, if you want to ask your road questions now. You okay, can. so, so t several road questions. One, you quickly talked about $450,000 for North Amherst design. It's not in anything that we have on a list right now, unless I completely missed it. I know it was there last year, um, did, Sean. So. Was it not in the um, planning list? Maybe that was. Did I just something. miss? I did I have, did it? Or, okay. So, so I have the same concerns I had about it last year. That I don't know whether we have a plan for what we want up there. So I don't want to design before we have agreement on what the design is. So the discussion on, is it a roundabout? Is it something else would be very useful. Um, then we had resident requests around, and Mandy is not here right now, but she had asked this. So I'm asking for, we had resident requests that we're talking about some speed bumps on Harrison Fisher, a crosswalk. And um, those were the big ones. And then a flashing light on speed down in the other. I don't know whether you took a look at any of those on the speed humps as opposed to bumps um, on the people who uh, bypass the light by going through Fisher and Harris. And that's increasingly happening and they zip, zoom through. They don't go slowly through. So Sean, you had indicated we might be able to get a reaction from Guilford at this meeting. And if not, I would like a reaction, uh, some thinking about, about those resident requests. There were there was a cluster of them. Yeah, I, I still have that cluster of resident requests I need to go through. Um, my my personal, <clears throat> I'm going to just say this once and then you guys can ask me questions about it if you want to, but making crosswalks that don't tie things together is not really, is, is not really thought of being a good way to do it. Um, so when you have a, a request for residents who just want to crosswalk to a sidewalk from nowhere, from a side of the street doesn't have a sidewalk, it's really hard for us to justify the crosswalk, even though people walk in the street and then cross the street. Um, the rules are such that you're supposed to go from a crosswalk, cross across, I mean, go from a sidewalk, cross the street and go to another sidewalk. There has to be somewhere to go to. We keep we we've been overruled several times by town council and other people when we re make this recommendation. But our recommendation is always going to be the same: is that no, you should not have a crosswalk that goes to nowhere because technically someone who's disabled can file a complaint against the town because we put aside a crosswalk to nowhere. Um, so those are crosswalks, speed bumps. I'm just going to give my general speed bumps tra traffic. Um, I'm going to give my general comment is 
Um, those can go in, but then are they really needed? Um, and are they really in the best places in town? And are we really willing to put them everywhere in town? Because once you just start putting them in because people request them and there's no guidance on, there's no guidance on them, we're just going to put them in. And, and that's the same with flashing crosswalk lights and speed back display signs. Everyone seems to want them because they're the latest thing, but are we willing to actually pay $12,000 a set for the flashing lights at every crosswalk in town. We have lots of crosswalks. And does that then make that flashing light less, oh, the word just is not coming to my head, less useful because they're everywhere. Um, the purpose of having different types of signage and different levels of signage is so that you create an area where you know if you see this one, it's a much more dangerous area, a much more that's an area to be safer. Um, it it kind of raises the expectation. Um, if we put the top of the line everywhere, everyone will expect the same to see this top of the line requirement or the most usage. And if there's not that usage, then people will start ignoring it. Um, so, uh, so those are my three comments about those. And you can. So it would be useful, I think, if you actually looked at them, because at least one of them tried to address the crosswalk to nowhere question. Um, so maybe we can get that next time, Sean. Um, just and and we had raised the um, Alex has actually raised speed humps. There are other places where we bypass. Do we have any kind of l larger plan on where might we do them? When might we do them and a vision? So yeah. I'm I think the I think the proposal from the resident requester was for the crosswalk to go to a on street walking path, right? I think was what doesn't doesn't meet ADA requirements, right? Okay. So then my, then my last piece and Pam um, on the actual roads, you you put in which streets you were thinking of doing with the road money, whether it's chapter 90 or our other. I'm not sure how you came up with those streets, but I had two questions about them and then also a comment. One is the ones downtown that are being heavily used right now by big trucks as large buildings are being built, the new apartment buildings um, that are going in. Um, do we ever ask the developer to share that? Because my observation is the roads get chewed up when the building is going on and then we're left up with a chewed up road. Um, so that's just a piece on that. And then the road repair coming out of town, coming up on North Pleasant um, is heavily used by UMass um, both for all the apartment buildings. Do we ever get UMass to help us with road repairs where a lot of the vehicle use is back and forth to UMass? So those are questions about that. And could we, redirect it to residential areas because we're getting a lot of requests um, from people in residence who would, would like to know when and if their road, which is becoming impassable, goes on the list. And could we make more of an effort to do smaller streets, side streets that are in residential areas? So I don't know. I know you've got a priority list and an internal, but I just wanted to raise those two things that I saw where it were on the list that are coming out of town um, and the developer impact of large vehicles, I mean, construction vehicle level. So that's the end of my comments. Sorry to, to Sean said me hit, hit, hit all of them while I've had the, have the mic, so. So we, that we base our paving list off of the pavement management system we have, which surveys the roads every five years. And then we put in the roads that deteriorated faster or have additional problems. We add those in as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So that's that's the basis for what we do. Um, and then there's there's things that happen, and they have to a road will have to be moved around because something happens. For the development, if we know development's coming and we know we're getting ready to pave the road, we'll wait. Uh, we've never there's no mechanism that I know of or that we have in place for asking people to pay more. There's no like development impact fee or anything like that for roads that doesn't exist right now. I don't think, I don't, I know it doesn't exist. 
Um, so <clears throat> those never get done. Uh, UMass, UMass helps sometimes, but um, there's not like a there's not like a dollar amount. But they'll they'll do some. They'll say, you know, hey, this would be a good, cool project. And I'll say, well, what do you think? And next thing I know, I have plans on my desk of how to do it. Um, so they'll do things like that, but they don't like give us like a check that says this is for road use or so forth. Thank you. Pam, sorry to hog the time. Okay. I think I think some of my questions did get answered in, in some of those. Um, <clears throat> I want to start back with the playing field. And I understand that um, the town DPW, the equipment staff, et cetera, does uh, contribute a fair a lot. They they manage all of those fields for the regional schools. And I wondered if there is some percentage of the cost of of us providing equipment and staff um, that the school then um, pays us back for, essentially. Um, and then a second question sort of related to field maintenance. Is it, is it the lack of staff that has not allowed us to maintain the fields, you know, up to, up to snuff, or is it the lack of equipment? Um, it, you know, which chicken comes first? And maybe we just stop at that and then, and then I'll go to my road question. Go for it. Do you mind if I start quickly? Sure. Um, so in terms of, um, the first question. Um, so in here in Guilford, and again, we're sort of entering through the middle of our budget process. It sounds like the equipment, the materials and the staffing are sort of a package deal when it comes to these field improvements. Um, so I think this committee considering it from a capital perspective makes sense, but there's gonna, the town manager has to consider the operating impacts as well and whether there's um, the ability to fold those things into the operating budget for next year, which is very tight at the at the current moment. So I think just keep that in mind that there's this piece, which is the capital side, but the operating side um, comes out of a different pot of money, which also has to be fit within uh, the allocation that's there. Um, and then whether the schools would pay for it, if we were to make a sizable investment like this, I think we would certainly look um, to set up some sort of fee for service type arrangement when it's being used pr for the regional school fields because I do get the I've heard a couple times the question about why should the town pay for this if it's being you know used to support um, the regional schools and the other member towns contribute as well um, I think that's a valid question and concern um, so if we do move forward with this type of investment it would only be if we get um, you know sort of reach an arrangement that we feel comfortable with, with sharing the cost, at least on an annual basis when it's used um, to serve the fields. Well, so, the, so sort of the follow-up question is, if we bought the equipment but didn't buy the, the new staff person to do it, would we have any improvement in our field? Kelford, you may want to weigh in, but it sounds like if we don't have the purse, you know, the staffing to operate the equipment the way you're, you're planning and we don't have the materials and supplies to that go into the equipment, um, it's not gonna be as effective as you're hoping for. So, one of the things that the DPW has done very well and we've actually realized has been pretty much a detriment to us is um, we make things happen. <laughs> so if the goal is, is that field levels improve and we don't get all the we get all the equipment and we get the materials, but we don't get another person to do this. What's going to happen is, is that we're not going to do some person's going to be cut from somewhere else and we'll spend more time doing the fields because that has been in our, in, until we're told differently, it's been pointed out to us that that's something that the town wants to change its level and raise its level of um, outcome. Um, so we'll adjust people accordingly to do that. Um, if you don't give us the, if you give us all the equipment and we don't have the material we need to do deep tine aeration and sanding and or, or, um, the sand for that, and you don't give us the seeds and you don't give us the fertilizer, then we'll do deep tine aeration and we'll try to find somewhere to pay for that. And it'll take money from something else we do in park and rec. Um, or park terrain grounds, not park and rec. 
<laughs> um, we have a rec department now, so I have to be careful saying that. Um, so that's really what, what kind of happens here at Amherst is people kind of agree this is what needs to be done and we kind of make it kind of happen. Um, so that's probably what it'll be what will happen. If you give us equipment and you say you want it to be a higher level of a higher standard of field and grass, then that's what you'll have. What we have now is it's not the fact that we're not doing it, it's we're doing it to the level that we were funded and staffed to now. Um, and for, if you want a higher level, we just need more. We can't do it with what we have now. We can't even make it work with what we have now. There has to be more input, people, material, and equipment to make it be the level that was described and that what people said they wanted. I mean, basically, I'm not being derogatory in this statement, is basically we want NCAA, NCAA level division fields out there is what, I, what we heard. Um, and yes, they probably won't be like an NCAA Division I school. They'll probably be somewhere on the lower end, but that's what we heard and that's what we were kind of told we want. I mean, you cannot, our fields don't come anywhere close to a community that has an, an artificial turf field and will, won't unless we put a lot more effort into them. And for the record, that may be the aspiration, but that's not likely going to be the outcome, the, the NCAA fields uh, goal. I understand. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I switch to equipment? Um, I, one of the items was the sidewalk plow, and there was a good discussion earlier this winter um, just about the, the extent of plowing that the town does as sort of a courtesy to connecting the dots around town of critical critical places like schools with sort of the downtown. Um, is a snow plow really $200,000 when we have all these other pieces of equipment, including trucks that are a whole lot less than $200,000. Maybe there was a, an extra zero added, just asking. Um, I didn't actually talk about those things yet. Do you want me to just go ahead and start? Uh, no, no, if you're, if you're gonna talk about them, that's fine. Um, if, you, if you're gonna talk through all that equipment, I can wait because some of these are equipment questions. Alex, is yours on the topics we've been on? Okay, let's okay. come back to that then, yeah. Yeah. Alex. Um, so um, thanks, Milford, as always. Um, so I guess two questions slash comments around the fields, and I apologize, I have not been following the fields. It's more like a background noise that I know about. So I don't know if a decision has been made, you know, turf versus natural, and does that impact the equipment we like are things decided for us to know what we need or does it not matter because we need what we need regardless of the type of field? The, the list you have now is for grass fields, not for an artificial turf field. So this is... And that, so that decision has been made that we're... No, I don't think that decision has 100% been made, but the, the, the thought process was, was that if the resistance to an artificial turf field continues, this would be the only way to make the grass fields what it would need to be. Well, and I think also, even if there is an artificial field, that's only gonna be one field of the five or six that are up there. So you're gonna need this equipment for the other fields because I think the what we heard was we need to approve all the fields, not just one, um, that all the fields needed quite a bit of attention and um, Alex, there also. I think there's still about a million dollars short for the full artificial, you know, so it's, it's got to more, more what yeah. I was just trying to figure out is, are yeah. we looking at a number that's based yeah. on something that's been decided or are we, I mean, what I'm hearing Sean say is regardless of what happens with that field, this equipment's needed. So it's, it's the time is right for us to be talking about the equipment regardless. So if I'm hearing that correctly, then that's, that was my question. Yes. Okay. Um, and then my second question slash comment is, um, you know, Guilford, as you know, at this point, I'm the longest standing member of the JCPC. And I think every year I say this, but, um, you know, I, I feel like IT and DPW are like these black boxes that nobody really understands the details of. And I think you do a really nice job every year. Um, and I actually, I really appreciated this year you putting, you know, what streets and sidewalks, um, because I could be like, oh yeah, that is a sidewalk I walk on. And, you know, thanks for doing that. And, and, but I, 
you know, and I know we, you've talked in the past about the paving management system that you have. And I don't know if maybe sort of like an improvement to the JCPC process is for us to have, I don't know if it's a summary. I, I feel like roads and sidewalks and speed bumps and crosswalks are something that come to JCPC every year. And every year we say, you know, yep, that's an issue. And then we sort of punt it back to, to, to Guilford to figure out how to make it work. And I guess if it keeps coming to us, it would be nice for us to, the, the more we can understand about the, how things are prioritized and the more we can understand like where to direct people to an existing list of priorities or the more we can understand, you know, to your point, Guilford, right? Like we can't have speed bumps everywhere. We can't have speed signs everywhere, but do we as a town identify those needs? If so, like, are we the process that they get identified? Is it people sending the emails to the little DPW site you have? Um, and just understanding how we as a community are making those decisions rather than the people who know about these processes and know, like, right, the people in the know, right? Dona showed up in force, you know, hey, good on them, right? But I mean, that's a group that's highly organized and they brought all their requests to us. But what about, you know, the other neighborhoods that aren't that organized or don't have those, you know, that, that access? So I guess I'm just encouraging again, the more information that we have about process and the more we can get out to the public what processes look like and how we make decisions. I think the, the, the better because people are generally understanding when they have all the facts or like, at least I like to think so. <laughs> Guilford, I'll add to the packet. Um, Paul just sent it along the presentation you and Jason did on the pavement management system and how those some of those decisions are made. And um, that was a really nice presentation. So I'll put that in the packet for today um, to help out with that question. But that's just that's just road paving. Um, that's not all the other projects. Um, and all the other projects, there is a there is a, I mean, there is a bit of uncertainty how they get chosen because we haven't sat down and made some of those decisions. I mean, the town council is just now talking about street lighting. Um, there was a proposal for crosswalk standards and it hasn't been sent to the town council um, because I mean, there is a transportation advisory committee and they've done some talk discussions about these things, but there's really, they're not integrated very well into how the council makes decisions or policies about what some things will be. So there are, there are, there is a bit of work that still needs to be done with that, Alex. And I agree with you that um, it's just something that's in the works. Okay. And then, sorry, my last question was, you had mentioned about sidewalks that if side up, sidewalks, that your priorities are downtown, as you know, I live downtown, um, and, but if sidewalks aren't ADA, they get pushed to the back, and we won't talk about the sidewalk in front of my house, which I know is not ADA, and we'll get pushed to the back, but I'm like, where do they land? Like, I totally get the why that that happens, but do they, when do they surface and how? <laughs> Um, when, when time, when time really shows up and we have a little bit of time, we'll pick up the ones that are harder and start working on them. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll look at a sidewalk and we'll go through and see if we can make all the little ADA things work. And if they can, good. And if they can't, then it gets set aside for a little bit. And then, yeah, it's like sometimes in the winter when it's slow, we will pick those back up and we'll work on them. Or if we have a, we work it into a bigger project, we'll work on those, um, we had a request, we had a bunch of requests in South Amherst for um, traffic calming and a whole bunch of other stuff. And out of that's come a whole bunch of the, kind of some rough plans for bus, bus stops that are ADA accessible, crosswalks that are ADA accessible, um, and a whole bunch of traffic calming down there. And they were onesie twosie things that came in. And there is actually is kind of a bigger project that we've kind of mushed all this into. And it's kind of like being worked on. Um, Yes, but you don't know about it. So you would, it does, it is kind of a black hole thing. And then. Yeah. Okay. I just, again, I just, I'd be, especially if the focus is around schools and downtown, you would like, logically, my thought is, oh, well, those are the places we really want to make sure the ADA sidewalks are compliant. But then if they get pushed to the back, it seems counterintuitive to sort of what you want in a downtown accessible area. So well, I'm sure it's not exactly how it works, but I just, well, the, down, the downtown stuff does get pushed up faster. Um, like, 
Um, th that's why the the section of Amity Street that was done was the easy section. The section that's down downhill is a little harder um, and a little bit more difficult to get together. So um, Kellogg Kellogg Avenue was a it was a bit of a problem trying to get those worked out, but we got those worked out about three years ago, and they're going to get the construction starts next year. They were supposed to or this year. They were supposed to be last year, but they're starting this year. Um, so. You, it, yeah, it just, it's kind of, you have to work through the issues, but you do pick up the ones that are easier to do. So you just keep things moving. I'd like to, I'd like to actually build on that. That brought up something that I forgot to touch on. And that is um, whether it's at the end of the JCPC session this year. So maybe in that, that one extra session that, that we in fact have some conversation about the process uh, exactly as, as Alex was just talking about, but also how to how to incorporate or or put in any kind of order the resident requests that come in. The resident requests come in could be totally ad hoc. Um, it's it's you know just because it came in that year does it mean that that something that must get addressed that year? Does it take priority or was something that, that the DPW has already established for the work plan for that coming year? So I think that kind of conversation would be really helpful to have for me, but also I think for, for people who submit a, a request um, to understand that it might not happen that year. And that if, if there are, um, I always love to plan. So, you know, where would I put all my, my time and energy Guilford talked about the two or three projects that could, in fact, end up becoming more of a whole, like South Amherst. Um, to me, that's that's a really good way to do it to to bundle things up so that you aren't you might you might do one of the three projects each year with a goal toward completing a, a bigger benefit. Um, so anyway, that's that would be good to I'd love to have that kind of conversation. On Kellogg Avenue, please, please don't take it down the rest of the oaks. They've already lost too many of those oaks on Kellogg Avenue. In your, in your uh, I don't, I don't think area. there's any more coming down. Good. There might, Good. There might. No, I think they got them all down already. No, they didn't cut them all down. There are a few left. And there are a few. Like, hold on to them. <laughs> There's some of the nicest red oaks in town. So Sean, I think we're ready to move to vehicles, but I just want to add, and you figure out the timing. Guilford mentioned, mentioned TAC and that they have some kind of sidewalk uh, pedestrian. When, if ever, would we intersect with them? You know, so some of the residents this year thought not, not illogically that they ought to go, go to TAC and I misinform them that come here first. So just just some discussion of where does TAC fit in all of this, you know, do, do in the process. And it's around roads, sidewalks, crosswalks, speed humps, and traffic calming, because that's something they work on also. So I'm not saying how to do it, but just um, come back with some idea of how we might want to think about that, because um, they're off in this other world. <laughs> um, so do you wanna um, I think go over, could, do you wanna go through your vehicles? I'm ready, we're ready for the big bucks. So it's vehicles and equipment. Some of this is equipment. Um, I do not know what list, what order you have yours in. So if you, if it's easy to give you want me, me to tell you. Yeah. yeah, you just tell me, I'll tell you what it is. Um, so the first one is a three quarter ton pickup truck uh, with plow for tree and grounds. So we, we, we as if, well, you, I used to have a nice little sheet I handed to you and you could see all the vehicles and you can see the windows of time we, we try to keep them in and replace them. Um, a three quarter ton pickup truck or a one ton pickup truck that's just a pickup truck or even a one ton dump truck. We look at, you know, 10 to 15 years as its lifespan and that we need to start replacing them in that time period. So the truck that's in this one to be replaced is going to be probably truck 70. It's a 2012. So it's in the 15, it's in the 10 to 15 year window for replacement. Um, it has 80,000 miles on it right now. And it's one of the 
softer. It's it's in, it's, in, it's got it has some con problems with the undercarriage right now, so it's a little bit of a some has some little problems with it. Um, the thing to remember on all the vehicle replacements we're talking about now, you're not voting on what I'm buying this year. Uh, you're voting on what we're buying 12 months from the beginning of the of J July 1st. We're not seeing any vehicles. Um, it's very hard to get a vehicle right now. It takes at least a year to get them, um, if not more. Um, the window for ordering vehicles has actually been reduced to a month and it does not correspond. It does not correspond at all with the state of Massachusetts budgeting process. Uh, the window to order new vehicles is January, the month of January, and our budgets are approved in July. So even, so if we have to wait to order a vehicle, you approve it July 1st, and then I can't order it until January, or January 1st of the next year. Um, so just so you know, so these vehicles won't show up for a year to 18 months out. Um, Is that, that, that's through the, the contract that you use? No. These vehicles, right? That, that's if you are a, if that's you, if you are a municipality, a state agency or a corporation who orders corporate vehicles, not just go on the lot and buy what's on the lot, you order stripped down commercial vehicles, you are, this is the window you're in. If you go to the lot and buy whatever's on the lot and you're willing to pay an extra $5,000 and it's, it's, a, it's a deluxe version with leather seats and all that, you can buy that truck then. But if you order a truck with vinyl seats, a work truck, you're going to have to get it into the queue and it comes through the queue and it's a very small queue right now. There's very few vehicles being made. So the next one, Guilford, is the sidewalk plow. Bar, do you want? I was going to go through all the vehicles and then turn over, if, unless it's um, urgent. I could we could do a question now if you want. Okay. Um, there's only three more. Um, the next one is the two hundred thousand uh, dollar sidewalk plow. So um, Amherst has always had about at least two plows that were dedicated to sidewalk plows. Um, we've tried over the years to not buy the these expensive two hundred thousand dollar models. Uh, we've done smaller pieces of equipment and we've done and more or less expensive pieces of equipment and they're not working out. Um, these, these, this equipment is made for sidewalk clearing. Um, it's a, it's a municipal, it's a, it's, it's, it's basically a commercial grade and for made for municipalities. It's four feet wide. Um, it's got the power to drive on the snow and push the snow out of the way or to run a snow blower if you need to. Um, we have one right now that's an M, it's called an M Mike Bravo MB. That's the brand name. Um, might be something else with that, but it's just an MB, municipal sidewalk plow. There's the trackless system, the trackless, uh, trackless, and there's Bombardier. Bombardier makes a really nice sidewalk tractor. Um, besides making leader jets, they also make a lot of snow equipment. They make the bombardiers that groom, groom your snow slopes and are used for uh, grooming uh, cross country trails and stuff like that. They're really, they're geared towards snow. They're not, they're not a front end loader that you try to use in the snow, uh, which is what we've been doing for about 15 years now. And, it's, and those two pieces of equipment are getting kind of old. Uh, we do have one true sidewalk plowing equipment, piece of equipment, and then we're just trying to replace, trying to get another one so we can replace the two loaders and keep a good good fleet for going forward with sidewalks. All right, and then the last two, I think, go together. It's the five, seven yard dump sander truck and then the snow equipment um, that goes with it. Correct, so we're replacing one of the larger dump trucks we have. Uh, these are sanders and uh, plow trucks and dump trucks. Uh, we're going to replace an international we bought in 2006. These trucks we try to make go about 20 years, 15 to 20 years in lifespan. So it's in the window. Um, this truck over had about 90,000 miles. That was in, that was earlier. So I don't know if that's the right mileage. Um, but these are the bigger trucks we use for doing the majority of the snow plowing and the construction work we do. Um, the two requests are separated because if you decide you want to buy the truck with chapter 90 money, 
chapter 90 money will only pay for the dump truck. It won't pay for any of the snow fighting equipment. So that's why the, we used to buy it with chapter 90, but then chapter 90 doesn't pay for snow fighting equipment. So you have to have two appropriations to get the whole truck. Um, so that's why they're split like this. There is one other piece of equipment we haven't talked about, and that's an asphalt hot box. Um, we have an asphalt reclaimer right now. We've had it for over 10 years. Um, we cannot get parts for it, and the machine is starting to have problems, so we need to replace it. Um, and since you can't buy parts, uh, we either replace it with the same type of machine, but we decided to go with sort of a cheaper option and go with what a lot of the communities in the area are using, which is a hot box, which take, basically takes asphalt pieces that you make for patching in the winter. And in the winter, you take these pieces and you put it in the box and you reheat the box and reheat the asphalt. And then you have hot asphalt to do patching during the winter. Um, it's a good system. It's a, um, it's an oldie but a goodie. It's actually hot boxes have been around for a long time and it's a, a tried, tried and proven technology and it works well. So Farah. Thank you, Guilford. I don't think I've learned so much about equipment as I've learned this afternoon. So I appreciate that. Um, my, my one question is, so based on the fact that you said that that you would not be able to get this till next year. Are, are your is your cost estimate based on whatever the increase there might be? Um, it's as it's as based on as best we can tell what the cost increase will be. Yes, we okay. talk to the suppliers and we base the numbers kind of on what they think it'll be. Um, if we if you do approve it and we get and we get the permission from the vendor to go ahead and buy it at those prices, they'll lock that price in for us, even though they can't get the truck for a year and a half or a year out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I was wondering about the, the patching, the patching dilemma. Um, probably 10, maybe 15 years ago, there was quite a discussion about having resin patches that wouldn't, that wouldn't involve heat. And it was something the state DP, or DOT was promoting. Do we ever do that? Uh, no, the, the resin patching didn't really work as well. Um, do you, have you ever made those resin coasters and stuff? Yeah. You know, it's very delicate stuff. And it actually does have a, it does have a window it has to be done in. And it's very, it's very delicate. Um, pretty much asphalt's stayed the true course away, either reheating your asphalt with a hot box, rejuvenating it with a rejuvenator machine like we like we have now, which is not working as well, or using infrared technology, or using just plain old cold patch. And a lot of places still use cold patch. And actually, we're one of the communities that's using a lot of cold patch right now. Because your hot box doesn't work. Yeah, because our hot thing doesn't is not working as well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not seeing any other, feel free to, um, we're, we're still at a quorum. So I was getting a little nervous that we were getting near to, to near not near miss, but go on, Pam. Uh, so back back to the snow plow um, equipment. Um, so the sidewalk plow is, is because um, you mentioned also in the same conversation, a couple of, of front loaders. Are, are you including a front loader capability or something on this? piece of equipment that makes it cost $200,000? Um, no, okay. they don't, they don't really have that capability. But we, I mean, we have, what we, what we've been using for, for snow plows are called um, Whackers. It's a Whacker brand. Um, and they're uh, WB25, we have a WB25 and a WB30. Um, if you look those up, if you, if you feel like the need to kind of really geek out on the equipment. Um, you can see what they are. They're just basically, they look, like, they look like toy. Some of the guys that operate them, you see they're huge guys and they fold themselves into these small machines. It's quite interesting to watch, but it's just a small little loader that runs on the street. Um, but we, um, 
we'll still probably be able to use them for a few more years in the capacity as, as a loader, um, small loaders. And then we have the bigger loaders we have as well. But we, we got those small ones basically for the sidewalks and then it's for small loading things. Thank you. I should bring pictures next time. Yeah, you're welcome to do a PowerPoint if you want to show visuals next time if you want. Yeah. So, so Sean, I just I went by it in passing, but Jilford talked about the, the North Amherst intersection, to, uh, large mine. Is that on a future? Uh, so it, yeah, it is. It was in the preliminary capital plan and the um, the section of projects that if we get a grant or if we get some additional funding source would be brought back up. So that so that's sitting there as as the maybe. Yeah, and that's and that's where it was last year too, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not on the list, it's not in. It's your... not in the. It's not in the plan. No, um, and and there was a conversation we had last year. Do we do the design work? And it's an ongoing conversation. Do we do the design work in order to make it more likely that we get a grant, or do we wait to try to get a grant for the whole amount? Um, and so I think that's an ongoing conversation. Do we just put the 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 portion in for the design work so that we can then maybe be more competitive uh, at getting a grant if we have that that component of the work done? So. Um, right now, it's not in the plan, but if something changes, we'll let you know. And so I don't want to, since it's not in our plan, I don't want to take up a lot of time on this, but we just, um, the council just approved, having had CPAC approve uh, a new development coming in in the Mill River area, um, uh, which will be affordable housing and, and condos. So my understanding of one of the ways you leverage to get the Massworks grant down um, in South Amherst was you got people saying this is really needed because of the development that's coming in here. So I would like to be aiming for a large state grant with an argument that it's only going to get worse and that we already have a set of issues. And Guilford, I know I've asked you this more than once, but when you put in the smart lights, smart light, which we all like, um, you said it could count. And then at one point you said the counting wasn't up right yet, but it was supposed to be able, we were gonna be able to, without a traffic study to be get, getting a flow of traffic study. So I don't know whether we could hitch that up if it hasn't been connected. Um, and so it's just part of this larger puzzle, Sean, of speed humps, sidewalks, uh, repairs um, on all of the streets that connect into this. When Pam asked for the, the bigger picture, I, I think it's a, it's a discussion that shouldn't be just happening um, at the DPW or inside town. Um, there's a lot of interest in this. So, so you're shaking. No, the car county never got connected. The, the car counting is there um, and we haven't we haven't connected it, but what people are asking for were the pedestrians and bicyclists, and that part is totally not there yet. Okay. Um, so that's the piece that's not working. Um, but if we want to do, if we wanted to do, if we want to collect the data of the vehicles, we can actually do that. We just haven't got it set up for that yet. It, I think it would be really good because we had an estimate of what would happen with North Square opened up. Um, there were projections, but now that it's not only open, but full and UMass is back in session, it seems like we need to be doing it while UMass is in session. So I won't take other people time, but Pam, it's just impossible to plan without some idea of what's going on in the intersection. Um, so. And, and the, 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 the whole pro the process for that intersection was to re-engage the neighborhood and a discussion of what was going on there and what the options were to before we actually do the design, but um, there was no right. money to do the design. So it wasn't like, well, we're not gonna start engaging if we don't have the money to do something. And since you already have at least two designs halfway done, um, it was like re-engage. So, so I'm, I'm looking for any other questions. I mean, I think Mandy sent in several, Sean, but I think we indirectly or directly asked, answered most of them. I mean, she had asked about this North Amherst set of cluster projects. So we, I think we're coming back to it. She, she didn't literally say it that way, but it was, uh, what about Pine Street, Fisher Street, Harris Street <laughs> um, was her question um, that we get 
So when Gilbert comes back, if he's coming back, just have a fuller discussion about that. And Alex, you asked for the bigger picture. I'd like a bigger picture of how we decide on speed bumps, if we have any kind of, you know, when and where we might put them in, um, in addition to any other traffic slowing we're talking about. Um, so, so that's just, that's a longer term, bigger picture. Uh, piece. And you're right, the North Amherst group got together and said, here's, here's an opportunity. So, Pam. I would, I would weigh in on the, on the speed bump question. And, and I think they belong on cut through or cut around or, or, you know, um, street, such as Cottage Street, which used to be a real problem. And it now is wonderful because it has three speed bumps in it. And, and Alex, you said you live on one of those. I think you said, yeah, yeah. I, I've got, I've got the trifecta. I've got speeding. I've got the cut through. I've got the sidewalks. It's all good though. <laughs> Feel free to get to me eventually. I, I'm confident. <laughs> so I, th I think that's it. Um, I do see we have public, so I want to open it up for public comments, but just making sure that we, there are no other hands up. So we are open for public comments if anyone has any. I'm not seeing, okay, uh, yes. Sean, you, I think you're the host. I, I can't do anything, right? Maria has been brought into the room. Thank you. Hello. Um, several questions about the the field equipment for for Guilford. Um, has uh, there been any consultation with professional groundskeepers about uh, doing soil testing and recommendations to develop a program for the field's needs and uh, what uh, does the equipment? And I know this is not the place to talk about the operating budget. Um, but for operating budget and staffing, does that meet those requirements? Um, and will there be specific training for DPW staff in how to provide this um, these needs? Um, a lot of uh, the the items under field equipment, and I, I uh, did not look for the others, but they all noted that they were using conventional fuel technology. And has there been any? attempt to see if these pieces of equipment can be electric powered versions and uh, what are the cost differentials. Um, Guilford, you mentioned, I believe that uh, the regional school districts, the community fields, Kiwanis and Fort River would be included, but I didn't hear you mention Groff Park, Mill River or Plum Brook. So uh, maybe that was uh, just an oversight and uh, if, if they weren't going to be included in uh, being having these this, these pieces of equipment used on them, why would that be? Um, uh, I'll leave it at that, but I might have some follow up questions uh, that I can I can send to you. And Maria, if you send them either to Sean or to me, we, we'll put them in a queue because some of the committee also asks. So that would be a useful route. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. So I want to thank everyone. Um, and thank you, Guilford, who may have left. Yeah. Thank you, Guilford, <laughs> very much <laughs> for being in the spotlight. Um, and thank you, everyone. Mandy sent me in minutes, but I didn't get a chance to look at them till just before the meeting. They were perfect the way Alex's have been perfect. So all I did was uh, a couple typos. So they, Sean will be posting them. So, and I'll particularly tell the people who left early um, or were or missed the last meeting that the minutes are available. And we all are all, as if people need to re-look at this far, we will send it to you right away. The recordings are available right after the, the meeting, but they are getting posted pretty much on schedule every Friday afternoon. So you can go and have a, a high probability of finding the meeting if you wanna go back and listen to a piece of it again. Pam. 
Uh, for Sean, is there a spreadsheet that, that each of these items shows up on? Um, I'm sure there is, but I don't know where to look for it. Yeah, so it's in the um, packet for um, our second meeting. Oh, okay. And yeah, it's in the preliminary capital improvement program. About halfway through, you'll see the, the spreadsheet that has all the individual projects listed for FY24, and then you can see some of the projects in the out years as well. Would it be possible, even though it's kind of redundant, could it just be tucked in each packet so anybody coming to a meeting could also see that and not know? Because I wouldn't have known to go back to the second meeting. Sure, yeah, I can add it um, to the packet. That'd be and, terrific. And, and Sean, rather than the entire thing, you could just pull out those tables. So that would be, you know, it's he's got them in an Excel thing that he plunks into the report, but then we would have the, rather than what page is the big table on, we'd be able to see it. Uh -huh. Alex? Yeah, I'm following up on that, but sort of, Bringing off that, what that reminded me of. So I know for me personally, a lot of times when I'm looking at the spreadsheet, that I wind up going back and pulling the old spreadsheets because it's nice to see what they asked for previously, but didn't get. Or and I don't know whether that's just me and my spastic, detailed ways, or whether it would be helpful for other people to see sort of prior fiscal years beyond the one. Like I just. Like, like the request from Cherry Hill today, right? It was originally a 2018 request, you know? And so I just, for me, it's helpful, but if it's not helpful for others, then I'll just, I know where to find them. <laughs> so I guess I leave that to the group if it's helpful to add or not. And, and Alex, I think it would be whether Sean has an easy way of showing us what didn't make it onto the list is what you're asking yeah. for. Um, yeah. I can always show the prior year, but showing prior to that, it starts to get a little, more difficult um, or just time consuming to um, go through it all and vet it all and make sure it's, you know, there hasn't been any formula or other things that we sort of finalize every year and then we start fresh the next year. Um, so I could take a look and see if there's anything that might be helpful along those lines. Yeah, no, actually, I mean, there's, I guess there's two pieces to it. One is, you know, what's been asked in the past and dropped, but I, that, I mean, I can do the research on that, but even just like what we did, right? Like we're, we always see what we did last year, but we don't see what we've done over like the last five years. And so or I think like I'm thinking about Pam who's just joined, like, you know, you would have no way of knowing that like we really changed like our allocations around sidewalks and really dug, I mean, it's never enough, but it's so much more than we used to do. And I just, I think sometimes having that historical information of where we spent money beyond just last year can be helpful in terms of thinking long-term. Yeah, there might be, maybe it's something we could fold just into the process. Um, you know, we like you said, we do the look back to the prior year, but maybe we expand it to go a little bit farther back. Um, I know, and the reason I bring that up is I know we've been getting a lot of questions on investments in roads. And while I know we never invest enough in roads, one thing we have done the last, you can kind of see clearly is the last five years, the investment in roads has gone way up. Um, and it might be helpful. I think you're right. That context is helpful to see where we put money. So um, I'll see what we can do for this year, but definitely in future years, I think we can expand that look back to be more than just the prior year. So these are great suggestions and, um, you know, both in our minutes, but we should be remembering them because that's part of what we can do in the report as recommendations. We're not just recommending around like this project, don't like that or more, but process questions, I think, um, have been, to me, incredibly useful because uh, the town manager and staff have been very responsive to saying, yes, there's a different way of doing it and it would be an improvement. So I think this process has been getting better and better as we have less and less money to spend might be one way of looking at it. <laughs> but, hey, we're at 10%, 10% so of the, the levy. Yeah, so okay. the one other question Mandy asked and Sean answered, but Sean, you can um, paraphrase, and I had had the same thing, the millionaire's tax um, that was supposed to be for transportation and education. The question is, any is any of that coming back and helping on roads and sidewalks? And Sean's answer was, so far, disappointingly, no. Is that what you answered? Yeah, I mean, everything's sort of disappointing on that front so far. Um, the educational monies, the, I mean, we knew that Town of Amherst was going to be on the lower 
end of the benefits of the additional money for education, but as so, so far as we can tell, there's no benefit, no additional benefit to the Amherst public schools um, from that uh, from the millionaire's tax. And then on the transportation side, um, I don't want to say no, there's none yet, but um, there's a bunch of money that went to the MBTA, which obviously that's not going to help us. Um, there was some money that went to the Department of Transportation for a grant program. And so I think we have to see more what that means that potentially could benefit us. Um, and there were some other other things like that, that there could be benefits to us potentially through a grant, grant process. Um, but it didn't, it was unclear if we would start seeing more chapter 90, for example, which I think is what a lot of us were hoping is that they would just put some of that into chapter 90 and give us an extra, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to do more roads. Um, it doesn't, I haven't seen anything that says that's going to happen. So um, I think we need a little bit more time to see what those programs are that the governor has proposed and ultimately, obviously, if they're approved. Um, but at first glance, nothing sticks out as an immediate boost um, on either front, education or transportation. And the legislature but, still has to weigh in. So this yeah, yeah, this is just the beginning. Our, where our representatives could also weigh in on definitely what might be a better use of those monies. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because it would certainly be nice if our chapter 90 money doubled. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a, a Guilford talks about, you know, he doesn't like a lot of state programs, but that one is one that is pretty straightforward and you can count on it and plan around it. And so I think in terms of improving transportation in Amherst, that's would be what we would suggest as more money in that program. So thank you. And Jennifer, thank you for rejoining us. We are, we are about to adjourn. And as I said, the, the, if you the parts you missed, if you want to see them, the town has been really good at get, about getting the recording up by Friday afternoon. So usually on the weekend, so you can just quickly go to whatever. We had a pretty um, we had a very good discussion about some recommended process changes in terms of informing us in future years, but also helping us make decisions this year. So it would be worth listening to it, and I. Um, with that, I th we're at 2.53, and unless I see a hand go up, I think we are going to adjourn at 2.53. Thank you all for your time and attention.